How many of you went on the men's retreat? Yeah, a bunch of guys. Yeah, we had an amazing weekend last week, an incredible time. I told all, I mean, literally one of the coolest things was on um, Saturday night, we, we did like some worship, teaching, and then like an hour and a half of worship and ministry time. It was, it was an epic Saturday night. It was so much breakthrough for so many guys. And then the next Sunday, we talked about community. And I was giving guys advice on how to re-enter from the mountaintop experience. I was like, hey, don't share everything. If you have a spouse, don't share everything at once. That will never really work. You'll get frustrated. Know that you're going to be, con- everything that you've experienced will be contended. That when you, whenever you grow an inch in the kingdom, the kingdom of darkness will challenge that. And that was my week. I just want to confess, I had a, I did not see it coming. One of those weeks where you are anticipating something and everything goes wrong. Anyone else want to talk, like, know what that feels like? Can we, just, can we be in a safe little place? I'm just letting you know where it all started for me. It was a rough week. Um, nothing, nothing really, like, major happened. It was just nothing went the way I wanted it to go. My wife got sick for five days, so I was at home with the kids. I couldn't work the way I wanted to work. I couldn't, like, own my life the way I wanted to own my life. And I noticed, um, if we're being honest, this just stays at the 1115, I noticed that what is inside of you comes out of you, right? Like, like the best way I could illustrate it is, like, whatever is inside of you, when the, when the life comes at you and the worst week you have, when things don't go your way and whatever's inside of you, when life gets shaken up, it comes out of you. <laughs> Just like that. Except the metaphor of water is more like anger, bitterness, control, disrespect, um, Insecurity, pride, fear, doubt, loneliness, depression, disappointment, anxiety. Um, Those are like the surface love. You want me to go deeper? Like legit just, you know, um, rage. And you realize that no matter how much you fast, no matter, I was. I literally started Friday a juice fast for three days. I'd made it two days, and yesterday, after Alex says, "Was this from Jesus or is this you?" I realized I would talk to Jesus later. I went on a walk, and I had to walk it out with Jesus. And I, I realized that I'm trying to constantly save myself. Does anyone else want to relate? I'm very disciplined. I'm constantly trying to. Fix everything I hate about myself. Is that a harsh word? Yeah. All the ways that I blow it as a husband or as a father, or as a pastor, all the ways I don't meet people's expectations. That it's, at some point, I realize that I will constantly do everything I can to save myself. And you know what we're preaching on today? What we're going to experience? The cross. What I realize is we need a Savior. And this week was an exceptional week of illustrating the fact that I need to be saved. And Jesus is my Savior. And no fast, no cleanse, no diet, no yoga, no seven steps or self-help book will ever save you. No religion will save you. Buddhism won't save you. Muhammad won't save you. Um, Spirituality, doing good, karma will not save you. The resurrected Jesus Christ who lived in human history and died on a Roman cross and currently is raised from the dead and reigning is the only way, truth, and life there is to experience the life that we were intended to live. So, <clears throat> good morning, 11. Thanks for letting me be real. I just decided that I'm just going to be myself no matter what. And sometimes some stuff comes out and it's not the best. So when you come forward, don't slip. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> But I know, I know that because of what we're just going to read in the scriptures today, there's enough. I mean, if that's all we did as we gathered, we did some singing and worship through that. Some of us gave some money. If all we did for the rest of the time was read scripture, it'd be enough. All right? So I know, but I know God's going to do amazing things because of this scripture. 
and his spirit is here and he's, his presence is here and we're gonna pray that he'll do amazing work right now in us. So Lord, we just open ourselves to you. What I know is in this room is depression and you can break it. I know anxiety is in our bodies and you wanna release the anxiety. I know that there is um, marital strife. There's massive disappointment. There's loneliness that's crushing. There's been a past that seems to follow us like luggage that we can't seem to get rid of. There's temper. There's unforgiveness. There's questions and doubt and fear. And we're all in this together. But Lord, I know you are Lord and raised from the dead. And I I believe that. And sometimes I need to be reminded of that. And I thank you that church on Sunday mornings when we worship reminds me of that. When six days through the week I was missing it. So I pray um, with the little faith that I have right now that you would build our faith to see you. Like Thomas asked, let me just put our hands in your side and touch your wounds. I pray that you'd meet us in our pain. That we would see you in a new way today. Give us a a revelation of of understanding to know you better and to know what you were up to 2,000 years ago and to know what it means today in our ordinary life. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm going to talk about the cross. We're talking about a series called Kingdom Culture, looking at um, the primary message of Jesus and all of the implications it has for today. So if you've missed the last seven weeks, you need to do some work to catch up. But today, we're going to talk about how um, the kingdom, we're going to talk about the kingdom and the way of the cross. And so what I'm going to do is just explore some things. I'm going to explore the theological dense reality of the cross being the fulfillment of establishing God's kingdom. So there's going to be some quotes in there, okay? Not Dallas Willard today, but some other great people, okay? There's going to be some, some scripture that's beautiful and will open your eyes and you'll be like, yes, thank you, Lord. But also, I'm going to talk about the cross and I want to show you um, the human humanity of the cross. And I want to sit in the, the heaviness of it. And then we're going, to, we're going to talk more theology and then we're going to land with what does it mean today on how we live our everyday, ordinary life when we go to work when we watch our kids, and when we deal with weeks that don't go our way, how does it all work out? Sound good? So if you have a Bible, go to Matthew. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter 26. And I'm just going to read some scripture over you. Um, but before, before we go to Matthew, I just want to say this. Um, for many of us, the cross, we see it as um, the ultimate expression of the gospel message. Um, and, and the gospel we've heard is the gospel of salvation, that, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so now, because he died and we've, he's raised from the dead, we one day will go to heaven. And it's a transaction, that the transaction happened on the cross, believe in it, and then one day you'll go to heaven. And there's, there's some truth in that. But what happens when you understand the, the entire narrative of the, the scriptures, we realize that God has been working since Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, to restore what was lost in Genesis 3. And there's this kingdom theology that works itself out, that God has been trying to bring heaven to earth and be in right relationship with all creation. And so it's more than just a transaction. What we see that God is going to bring heaven on earth and that the cross is partly to do with sin, but it has more to do with expelling the rulers of the age and establishing his kingdom once and for all so that all the promises of the Old Testament and New Testament can be experienced here and now. Are you with me? All right, so N.T. Wright, who's a brilliant theologian, he says it this way. Throughout his public career, Jesus was engaged in launching his kingdom project. But it was on the cross that it came to its triumphant conclusion. That is why when Peter tried to turn Jesus away from his vocation to suffer, Jesus called him Satan. That is why the mocking voices urging Jesus to come down from the cross echo so disconcertingly the mocking voices in the temptation narratives. Without the cross, the satanic rule remains in place. That is why the cross is for all four gospels. And N.T. Wright argues that, Jesus himself argues that it's the ultimate messianic task and it's the last battle. The evangelists do not suppose that the cross is a defeat 
and the result, uh, 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 sorry, and the po- uh, is sorry, defeat with the resurrection as a surprising overtime victory. The point of the resurrection is that it is the immediate result of the fact that victory has already been won. Sin has been dealt with. The accuser has nothing more to say. The creator can now launch his new creation. That's good, right? I like it. So Matthew 26. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these are gospels. They're called the gospels according to Matthew or Mark. They're narratives. They're biographies of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And what you have are four different accounts of similar stories of Jesus' life ministry. Um, But in every gospel, what you see is this kind of uh, three, the, Jesus ministered for about three and a half years and then he died and then he rose again and then you get Acts. But what you have is basically a very fast-paced journey through Jesus' life and ministry. It goes really fast in every gospel account. And then when it gets to like the last days and hours of his life, everything slows down in time. And there's all sorts of details that we get that we wouldn't normally get in the pace of the first parts of the gospel narratives. But in this, the part on his death, we get all this information that, uh, and all these details. It's as if the gospel writers are wanting you to pay attention to what's going on here. Okay, so I want to just read what's going on and show you what Jesus went through, and then we'll sit with it for a second. So it's going to feel heavy, okay, but let it feel heavy. Let's not, let's not try to, like, ease our way through this stuff. Matthew 26. Um. Matthew 26 is where it's a long one. Verse 14, so it says, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. One of the twelve, so one of Jesus' closest friends that he lived with for three and a half years, they traveled together, they prayed together, they ate meals together, they, they healed people, they casted out demons. He mentored, discipled, met with him every single day. One of those kind of friends betrays him. Have you ever been betrayed? Have you ever felt betrayed by a loved one, by a close friend? Have you been neglected, rejected by friends? Jesus was betrayed by one of his closest friends. It goes on, he has the Last Supper. He predicts that Jesus is gonna, uh, sorry, Peter is going to deny him. And then verse 36, this is the the moment before he's uh, captured. It says, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, John and James, along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He he says to his three closer friends, so he has the 12 and the three, his best buds, keep watch. So stay up at night and pray. It's it's this discipline that comes from the Jewish practice of being in the presence of God. Keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell on his face, to, he uh, fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away for the second time. My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back again, he found them sleeping again because their eyes were heavy. So the, the, he left them and one, uh, went, again, went away once more and prayed for a third time, said the same thing. Then he returned and he says, are you still asleep and resting? Look, the hour has come for the man to be delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So the night before Jesus will be crucified, he asked his closest friends to be there for him. And they're not there. They fall asleep because they're tired. And the prayer that Jesus has in other accounts, it says he, the, the, he, his sweat, he, uh, he sweats out blood. He's so, it's so intense. Sorrow. Have you ever felt depression? Have you ever felt sorrow 
to the point of death? Have you ever been in this crisis where you don't want to do something that you have to do? For Jesus, he didn't want, in this passage, what we hear is, I don't want to endure the cross, but I will be obedient to the point of death. And he does. But he asks friends to stay up and pray. But where are his friends? Have you ever been lonely through a crisis? Have you ever had to stay up in the middle of the night because your kids are sick in the hospital? And you want friends to be there, but they're not? Have you ever been that lonely? Jesus is arrested. He's brought before the Sanhedrin, which was the, the rulers of the temple. And they, they say that he's blaspheming God. And the, in verse 67, it says, they, then they spit on his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. Hey, you are also with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it. I don't know what you are talking about. Then he went out to the gateway where the servant girl saw him and said the, uh, to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth and he denied it again with an oath. I don't know what, who that man is. And a little while later, they were standing out there. Uh, they said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away and he calls down curses. I don't know the man. He's brought before Pilate, the ruler for the Roman ruler for that area, the governor of that area. And he debates whether or not he should hand him over to be crucified. And instead, the crowd asked for Barabbas to be given away. And it says, verse 26, they released Barabbas, a murderer, instead of Jesus. And then they had Jesus flogged. And they handed him over to be crucified. It says, then, verse 27 of chapter 27, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. They took a staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on. And they led him away to be crucified at Golgotha. So Jesus, here's the list. Jesus was questioned, betrayed, spit on struck, slapped, mocked, denied three times. He was given a crown of thorns, stripped naked, struck with a rod. He was flogged and insulted and crucified, left naked alone to die. Jesus' death um, was, was the worst kind of death known to man. Jesus' death was the worst kind of death created by man. The crucifixion created by the Romans was designed to keep someone alive as long as possible in the most amount of pain before they died. So literally Jesus was given the worst kind of death known to mankind. Life through the worst at Jesus. And that's the image we have. I want to give you, if you have a little kid in here, I want I would avert your eyes because I want to put a graphic image up. But I want you to think about that list. And I want you to see this picture from the Passion of the Christ movie. It's an image of what crucifixion looks like. And it's probably the most helpful to understand how bloody it was. It's this. Beaten, struck, mocked, denied, questioned, left alone, disciples betrayed. And if you were to to just take this in for a second, just to, to look at it. When you see this image, you would think what everyone else thinks, that uh, Romans 1, Jesus 0. That, that's the ultimate sign of defeat. Cross was the ultimate expression of defeat by the Roman Empire. But that's not how the New Testament writes the narrative. The, God, the followers of Jesus and the writers of the New Testament begin to talk about the cross not as defeat, but as the ultimate victory. 
that what you see is what you think is someone who's seemingly losing, but actually he's really winning. So let me go to Colossians real quick. Would you go to Colossians with me? Colossians chapter two, verse 12, it says this, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You're just pausing that for a second. That's pretty good news. Paul says that when you confess Jesus is Lord and you practice this act, the symbolic act of baptism, Paul says something theologically has happened, something historically has happened, something practically is happening, and it's pointing from to the past and it's pointing into the future, and it's this beautiful symbol. And if you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. Baptism is a symbol that Paul says, the image of you going into the water, he says, is like you dying on the cross with Jesus. You going underwater is like you being buried in the tomb with Jesus. And you coming out is like you being raised from the dead. And Paul says that while we were still in our sins, dead in our sins to our flesh, God made us alive in Christ. When our sins were held against us, God forgave us of our sins. What did he do with them? He nailed them to the cross. So when you see that image of Jesus, you should see your anger. You should see your resentment. You should see your terror week. You should see the way you acted when things shook. You should see all of that past tense has been crucified with Jesus. Can I get an amen? That's good news. That's really good news for someone who screwed up this week. Because as we go in our journey towards following Jesus and we get it right sometimes, we think we've earned it. We think we can, we can discipline our way, practice our way around the things. And Jesus will constantly remind her through this, you can't possibly earn what I've already given. But, but that's, this, that's this right relationship thing. You see, we're invited into relationship with God. And in order, so, so the things that we thought were in our way are now gone. So we have this right relationship, but something so much bigger is going on on the cross. Look at the next verse. This is where I was like, oh my goodness. Paul is such a genius. He says, verse 15, nailing our sin to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The image of Jesus on the cross is the ultimate image of defeating evil and the power of darkness. This is the decisive moment where God's kingdom breaks in and established. Somehow, this is what N.T. Wright says, somehow Jesus' death was seen by Jesus himself, and then by those who told and ultimately wrote his story as the ultimate means by which God's kingdom was established. The crucifixion was the shocking answer to the prayer that God's kingdom come, God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. It was the ultimate exodus event through which the tyrant was defeated, God's people were set free and given their fresh vocation and God's presence was established in their midst in a completely new way for which the temple itself was just an advanced pointer. How, how's that? Is that? Can we, do you want me to break down that quote real quick? What N.T. Wright is saying is that the cross was the ultimate manifestation of God's kingdom being established on earth as it is in heaven. You see, there's, when he says the Exodus event, I didn't do this in the first service. It's so, why didn't Jesus die on Yom Kippur? He died on, why, did he, why was he the Passover lamb? Because it wasn't just about the atonement. It was about liberation into a new exodus. That's a whole other sermon. I'm sorry I brought that up. Now you're like, wait, tell me more about that, but I can't. <laughs> Essentially though, there, was, there, was th there were a couple of things that were going on at the Passover. Number one, Israel is enslaved to Egypt. Number two, Egypt ruled over the um, uh, uh, the Israelites. And number three, 
there was this, this Passover, this angel coming that was going to kill all of the firstborns, and they needed so, a, a way out. So God gave them the Passover lamb as the way out. So what happens on Passover is not only is the, the Israelite, uh, sorry, not only is the Egyptian king defeated, the tyrant, the ruler, the Israelites are set free, and God atones for their sins. There's three things going on. God's atonement co passes, covers over them. So when we get to the cross, what we see is God sets us free from our sin, frees us from our slavery, and defeats the ruler, which wasn't Rome. It was Satan. You with me? So there's this new exodus emerging. That's how the kingdom theology, that's how the cross fits into the kingdom right? It's this bigger narrative. This is not just about, oh, Jesus died and now we get to go to heaven. No, 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 no. He's taken the rule back from Satan and now he has it rightfully so and he gives it back to us so we can now build the new creation that he intended humanity to build in Genesis 1 and 2. How are we doing, church? I told you there's some dense theology. You did so well. Just one more thing public spectacle. Something's going on here. I want to show you this, 1 Corinthians, because I, I I've been meditating on the resurrection. I've been meditating on the cross as we head into Good Friday, and I got to 1 Corinthians 15, and I saw this part, and I was like, this is, this is so interesting to me. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says in verse 54, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So, I was thinking about what Paul's doing here. I was thinking about, I mean, it's a strange way to talk about death. He's quoting Isaiah and Hosea here. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Have you ever lost a loved one? There's a sting to death. Where, O oh, death, and, and looking at the way Jesus died is brutal. It's the worst possible death a person could experience. It's the worst possible thing. It's the worst thing the, that life could throw at Jesus is thrown at Jesus on the cross. And Paul's like, where, O oh death, is your sting? It reminds me of when I was in college, and I used to play, I used to serve in the middle school ministry at Rock Harbor Church, and we would play dodgeball with sixth graders. Now, when I was in sixth grade, dodgeball was not fun based on my size and agility. Um, <laughs> if you don't know that story, it's my past. But when I was a college student playing against sixth graders, it was a lot of fun. Because what those sixth graders do with their weak little arms is they throw their hardest at you and they give you everything they possibly have. They throw everything they got at you and then you, they, you take their best hit and you catch it. <laughs> and they're out. And what do you do when that happens? Is that all you got? See, what Paul doing, is doing here is he's taunting death. Is that all you got? Because if the worst possible thing that your enemy can throw at you is thrown at you and you're still standing, what does that mean? You're going to win. Jesus on the cross absorbs the worst possible thing, the kingdom of darkness, life, humanity can possibly throw at him. And what does he do to win? He absorbs it. And he defeats evil through self-sacrifice and love, which is the way of the cross. The kingdom is ultimately expanded through self-sacrifice and love. Not through domination. Not through conquest. Not through pushing our way through. Absor absorbing, surrendering, and loving, because love really wins. Isn't that interesting? That the way of the cross gives us a different way to work in the world. That 
the way of the cross shows us a new way to live that's fundamentally different than the way of the world. Because the way of the world, it's so clear how we get ahead in the world and how we win by the way of the world. Is it not like somebody cuts you off on the freeway? The way of the world is you go around and cut them off and slow down because eventually they'll realize that they cut you off and they'll pull off on the side and weep and you will have victory as you head off. <laughs> That's what we're always thinking. Or if you're worse, you're like hoping they get a flat tire. You know you've had, is it just, you know, okay, you know, some of you know you've had those thoughts. Or your spouse says that thing. And she like digs at that pass thing. So it's a button she pushes. But you say the other thing and it was so smart and it's two buttons at the same time. And so you, you know what I'm saying? That's what you do in the way of the world. That's how you win. You defeat it by being smarter, clever, by going harder, faster. You don't win by surrender. You don't win by sacrifice. You don't win by laying down your life. You don't possibly get your way in marriage by laying down your life for your spouse to show them Jesus. Or do you? You see, the way of the cross is an alternative way to live today. It's a new way to live today. That actually the image we carry around with us, okay, Jesus on the cross is the ultimate revelation of what God looks like. Jesus on the cross is the ultimate image, revelation of what God actually looks like. So any other image, any other voice, any other idea you carry around about God and what he looks like needs to be eclipsed by the image of Jesus on the cross. Our God is the kind of God that will absorb the sin, absorb the evil, evil to, on our behalf to release us into this world with purity, justice, freedom, and inheritance. Our God is the kind of God that will take on the insult, take on the abandonment, take on the loneliness so we can live in community again. That's the kind of God we have. Now, it's personal, it's reality, and it's practical, but there's also one more deep theological thing I want to give you. Here we go. This one, I think, is so beautiful because I want you to see how the kingdom works itself out um, and also what God does on the cross and what he's doing for us today, and it reveals a character that he has, which you can see from a macro level, and then we're going to look at it in a micro level in one second. So um, Gregory Boyd, pastor and theologian um, says this, the cross not only reveals that God judges sin by turning people over to the consequences of their sin, it also reveals that this is how God defeats evil. He uses what I call an, an Aikido style of judgment. An Aikido, uh, Aikido is a nonviolent school of martial arts in which practitioners never respond to aggressors by using their own aggressive force. Instead, they outsmart their opponents by using techniques that turn every aggressive action back on the aggressor. Aggressors thus end up punishing themselves. This is precisely the method God used to judge the sin of the world and vanquish evil on Calvary. To understand how, God, uh, how the cross reveals an Aikido style of judgment, we need only connect three dots. Now stay with me. First, the New Testament indicates that Satan and other fallen powers helped orchestrate the crucifixion. Among other things, John tells us that Satan entered into Judas just before he was betrayed, uh, be before he betrayed Judas, uh, Jesus in John chapter 13. Paul informs us that the rulers of this age, referring to Satan and other cosmic rebel powers, crucified the Lord of glory. Second, demons readily recognized Jesus as the son of God, but they were completely mystified as to why he had come to earth. Third, Paul informs us that had Satan and the rebel powers who currently reign over the world understood God's wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8. For it is by the means of the crucifixion which they helped orchestrate that they are being reduced to nothing. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. As we read in Colossians, by the means of the cross, God disarmed the powers of, and authorities and made a public spectacle of them. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. When we connect these three dots, 
we see that God managed to get the kingdom of darkness to orchestrate the very event that brought about its own demise. Do you catch that? That's what we call sovereignty. That's what it means for God to be in charge. You with me? So that's the rich theology that I wanted to leave you, but I'm going to get, go back to the practical. The image that we carry of God is the one on the cross. Would you put up that list one more time? So one of the things I was thinking about is my week, and thanks for being like group counseling for me. Um, what's inside of you comes out when things don't go your way. What's inside of you comes out when your life is shaken. So this happens all the time. It happens when we deal with sickness. It happens with crisis of finances. It happens when we lose our job. It happens with conflict in relationships. It happens all the time. What is, how do you respond in those moments? And I was thinking macro. So this is God absorbing the sin of the world, absorbing, absorbing evil, orchestrating its own demise through letting them run the show. And Jesus, who seems to be the weakest person in the room, handcuffed, questioned by authorities, nailed to the cross, is actually operating in the greatest power known to human history, which is love. How does Jesus respond when the worst is thrown at him? Luke chapter 23, it says this. As he's nailed to the cross, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. A little bit later, there's two criminals being crucified next to him, and one starts hurling insults, and the other goes to his defense. And in verse 42, the criminal says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. When the worst possible thing is thrown at Jesus. What comes out of him in those hard moments? Forgiveness. An invitation. Inclusion. That he can't help himself in experiencing the pain and turmoil and loss to forgive those that are hurting him and include others along for the ride. That even on the cross, he's welcoming people to a seat at the table. Isn't that amazing? There's one more story that I was brought to tears by. John 19, verse 25. John 19, verse 25. So here's the gospel writer, John, his account. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, who, just so you know, his name was Mary, his mother's sister, and then the other Mary, the wife of Clopas, and then Mary Magdalene. So there's three Marys and the other girl. When Jesus saw his mother, I just thought that was funny. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby. So John, his title for himself in the gospel is the disciple whom he loved, which I think is brilliant. It's like, and the disciple who is Jesus' favorite. Um, that's like, this is what we need to get to. We need to see that. So John says <clears throat> in his gospel account, when Jesus saw his mother there as he's on the cross and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to the woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. So Jesus is on the cross dying, a tortured death. And what comes out of him is, who's going to take care of my mom? Forgiveness. Inclusion. Invitation. Who's going to look after my mom? Do you see how beautiful that is? That image? And we often, we could say, well, he was God. You know, God, that's how God would act. But what the stories and the narratives tell you is he was fully human. And Jesus had to learn over time to become the kind of person that could only say, forgive them, come with me. Who's gonna take after my mom? And I believe that's the invitation for us through the cross. Is that through the cross we can learn in moments like last week for me, how to respond the way Jesus would respond if he was in my situation. I can't do it on my own. I have to do it with partnership with grace and the Holy Spirit. But that's the trajectory we're on. Are you with me? Jesus on the cross is the greatest revelation of what God looks like. Jesus 
responds, always responds in love. And I love these quotes, and we'll end practically in just a second. Jesus is what God looks like when there are no clouds in the way. And God is Christ-like. And in him is no unchristlikeness at all. Jesus always looks as kind as Jesus. You see, the cross is the greatest revelation of how we build the kingdom here and now. It's not a literal death but it's an invitation to learn to bring life through our self-sacrifice and love and death to self. That Jesus offers us an alternative way of bringing the kingdom wherever we go. And so the cross is God's way of saying, is that all you got? He responds to the worst possible things and he defeats it. He has victory but he offers another way to live. And I was thinking about that today. I, and, and I was running this morning because I, I had to confess a lot of stuff this morning. Um, confess meaning, you know, I shared earlier. But I was running and I was thinking, I had this image where I was on stage and I was thinking about all the things that I, was, I messed up with. And for some of us, maybe this image is helpful. But it, was, it, it, it helped me understand what's going on personally. So the cross is a way to interact with the world. I want you to take that out and know that and live that out. The kingdom of God, the cross fits in the kingdom. This is what God's doing to establish his reign. Um, we can learn to live the way of the cross in every situation of life, whether we're parents, whether we're business owners or pastors, whether we have roommates, that that becomes the alternative to the way of the world. That the alternative is laying down your life. That's how we win because love really does win. Um, but also the cross is, is significant because it's personal, because we need a savior. But I was thinking about today, I'm 34 years old, and I have 34 years of history. Anyone else know what I'm talking about? Like, I have a train of stuff that I have led, and I actually felt it this week. I felt it Saturday, and I, I feel like the only way I could describe it is like, imagine me walking in here with the week that I've had, and it's just a bunch of luggage. Just all the ways I, I was bitter and resentful and angry. I lost my, my, I lost my temper at my boy. I had to apologize to Ezra like 17 times this week. No joke, not exaggerating, like 17. I'm like, why, why is this coming out? And I, I'm processing it. I have a meeting with Bill to talk to him about it. <coughs> True. And I've confessed it to friends and I'm working through my junk. Hopefully you have that community. Because I told my friends, I'm like, I'm op operating out of a character that doesn't reflect who I want to be. And, and I'm not going to pretend. I'm going to, no, this is real. I'm in real time. But I, I just imagine I'm just carrying all this luggage of 34 years of gluttony, 34 years of pride, 34 years of lust, of greed, of envy, of jealousy, of insecurity, of fear, of self-hatred, 34 years of the way of the world, pushing two buttons, saying, calling my wife names, doing the things that I know are, I could literally walk in and have so much junk. And I had this image of me coming to Jesus with all this junk. And then I start handing it to him. And it's like, I finally get my backpack off. It's like the heaviest. And I see Jesus there. And then I, in my head, I had this image and I'm like, oh, there's there's still some stuff in my pockets. And like I, I put this stuff there and Jesus says to me, is that all you got? Is that all right, go. You see, the cross is God's way of saying to you, is that all you got? Go ahead. <laughs> 